this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss. And today, we're on episode six of our series called A Passover Backstory. We're flying through the series and I hope that you're getting a lot out of it. But if for some reason you've happened to miss some of the previous episodes, don't worry. We've got some options for you to be able to go back and see them. Here in a moment, I'll give you a brief recap of what you missed. But if you want to see them yourself, you can watch them in their entirety on YouTube. We post all of our programs on there, and you can also find them on social media. Just search for at Crosstalk TV on all of the popular platforms, and you should be able to find our channel and see some of the different episodes as we share them when they come out. And of course, you can always find them on our website, crosstalk.org. Something else that you can do if you're wanting to take a deeper dive into the series is you could check out the book that the series is based on. You can purchase a paperback copy of the book or uh, download a free PDF copy of A Passover Backstory, written by my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss. You can also get that at randyweiss.com. The book contains even more information than what we're going to be able to cover in these episodes, and so I encourage you to check it out. Now, let's do that recap that I promised. There are a few basic Hebrew terms that you need to be familiar with. Don't worry, the series is in English, but we do occasionally reference some Hebrew words. Pesach is a Hebrew word from Passover, which is the biblical celebration for remembering how God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. You might remember it from the book of Exodus, and you've probably seen some popular movies about this uh, very famous instance. A Passover Seder is the, ma the main meal that happens during Passover. A Haggadah is a liturgical text that is read at a Passover Seder, and it's, it's sort of like a script for the celebratory meal. Matzah is a flatbread kind of like a cracker that's made without leaven and it's a requirement for a Passover Seder. You probably recall taking matzah or crackers like matzah during your own communion celebrations at church. Lastly, kametz is the Hebrew word for leaven. Leaven represents sin. There can't be any of this in the Passover Seder. And I encourage you not to have any sin in your own life as well. All right. Now that we've got those basic terms out of the way, there's one more thing that we need to recap. The last episode ended with my dad talking about the Israelites and their idol worship. God had delivered them from the Egyptians, but they held on to some of the sinful traditions that they learned when they were with the Egyptians. Not long after that, God provided miracles for them to be free from the Egyptians, and they ignored God again and turned back to their idol worship. They were quickly set straight but this cycle of God doing awesome things for the Israelites who quickly turned back to their idolatry ended up being a really easily defined pattern. That's where we pick up today. Let's jump right in. Oh my gosh, dinner rolls. We're gonna be excommunicated. Are Easter Bunny's kosher? Jesus Christ, who forgot the matzah? Wait, a separate checks, please. As my mother would have said, oy vey, a pattern was revealed. They didn't get rid of their idols nor forsake the gods of Egypt. Then I thought, I will pour out my fury upon them and fulfill my anger against them while they are still in Egypt. God was judging us. And he intended to pour out his anger on us while we were living as slaves. This happened during our bondage. Our enslavement happened precisely as God had predetermined and foretold to Abraham centuries in advance of the fulfillment. Now, initially, I was just perplexed. But then I became distressed. I read the relevant chapters in six different versions. It made me even more upset. 
I sat there reading and praying. I talked to myself. I prayed some more. The folks in the coffee shop probably thought I was imbalanced. Literally, I sat there for hours reading the same things over and over and over and over. I met with a mature Christian friend and his wife, and I asked them to pray for me. I invited them to help me sort out my concerns while sitting in the coffee shop. Their great friends and their encouragement was helpful, but I was on my own to sort out my troublesome conclusions. All I could do was ask God, God, what did you expect? I was angry. Everything about this account in Ezekiel seemed unfair. I finally framed my anger into a question. It was an ugly question. I asked God, what did you expect? You left us alone in Egypt. We were enslaved by pagans. We had no teachers. We had no rabbis. We had no Torah. We had no prophets, priests, or pastors. We just wanted to get by and not be beaten. We were surrounded by idol worshipers who were in charge of our meals, our work details, our housings, our very lives. Barring a miracle, which we had never seen in 400 years, all we could expect was a dismal future. We just wanted to survive again. And again, I asked God, what did you expect? Of course, the birth account of Moses was akin to a miracle. But who knew about that except for his parents and older sister? Who knows how many slaves had heard the story of Abraham's ram caught in the thicket? Which slaves had records of Jacob's ladder or Joseph's dreams? Perhaps none of them knew. Were the slaves surfing the internet to catch up on episodes about the faith of their long-forgotten ancestors, or were they just trying to avoid the whip and put enough blocks in Pharaoh's wall to keep their own families from starving? I don't know, but many of the slaves probably wanted to act like their Egyptian bosses. They probably wanted to endear themselves to the people in charge so they could garner extra rations or secure a better position among the other slaves. Mirroring Egyptian beliefs and culture was probably a normal aspiration for underappreciated, overworked slaves. If they could fit in, it would be safer than standing in opposition or being singled out. Respecting the religion of their bosses was likely a smarter play than demeaning the pagan beliefs of their taskmasters. And after hundreds of years of hopelessness, they held little hope that religion would get them out of slavery, going along to get along. It might have seemed like a wise choice to a pathetic slave. None of this seemed fair, and I was angry because I know life isn't always fair. But I couldn't reconcile God's words in Ezekiel. He was thinking about pouring out his fury on a bunch of people who might never have gotten the memo about what God expected of them. I mean, they may have had no reason to believe God was coming back to take them out of Egypt. The more I studied, the more I struggled. 400 years earlier, Joseph believed that the day would come when the Jews would leave Egypt. He certainly wasn't anticipating centuries of slavery before that day. At the close of his life, he said, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Moses was aware of Joseph's dying aspirations. His bones accompanied the freed slaves when they departed Egypt. But Joseph's prayer was spoken 400 years earlier, at the time of his death, prior to his people being enslaved. Before I left the coffee shop, I called another highly respected friend in Christian leadership, and I was blessed to be able to visit with him and one of the premier Bible teachers of our generation. They recognized I was uncomfortable with my own conclusions and my inability to come to terms with the discrepancy I was feeling. They challenged me at a deep level. My questions sounded irreverent and a bit unchristian. Nevertheless, their prayers and counsel were a great blessing. 
But I got to say, my answers remained elusive. Only a revelation could bring peace. I was unable to get any release to drop the matter. I continued reflecting. What did God expect from a bunch of hopeless slaves who'd been left in their condition for centuries without leadership or a map to freedom? <sighs> My personal theological default position goes back to Randy's rule of theology number three. God is good and he does all things well. I finally just hit the reset and went back to my born-again factory default. Since God is good, since he does all things well, this conundrum must also be good. I quietly gave thanks for the struggle, and then I started over at the beginning from the correct default setting. God established slavery as a requirement for my people hundreds of years in advance. He told Abraham about it, so we couldn't say we weren't informed, and we know God wasn't surprised. Slavery must have been necessary for us. Though Paul's letter to the Romans had not yet been written, the famous promise of verse 28 in chapter 8 is true. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Somehow slavery was good because it was absolutely included in the plan of God for the ancient Jews. I didn't like the sound or feel of that conclusion, but I stuck with my default. If we needed to become slaves in Egypt and to remain slaves for centuries, then God must have planned our servitude in Egypt with a divine purpose. Slavery was a requirement for God's salvation plan of the ages. If he required slavery for us, slavery must have been good. But now somehow I needed to find out why. I mean, I felt like Gordon Gecko in the Wall Street movie declaring greed is good. How could a 21st century writer suggest slavery is good and still warrant a credible hearing by thinking believers? Well, to a slave, slavery is certainly not good. But I believe in a God who can find purpose in all things, even circumstances that seem beyond redemption. And then suddenly the light went on. We were in Egypt for more than 400 years, yet we retained our identity. Do you realize that the only thing that separated the Jews from the Egyptians was slavery? Slavery is what kept us from assimilating. Slavery was the impassable bridge across which the Jews were simply not allowed to travel to enter Egyptian society as an equal. The Jews were slaves. Slavery was the only thing that kept the Jews from becoming totally absorbed and integrated as Egyptians. Had the Jews not remained separate and distinct, even if only as slaves, we would have been lost to God's salvation plan of the ages. And the Jews were essential to that eternal purpose to which God had called us. Without the barrier of slavery, the people of God might have been swallowed up by the people of Egypt. Moses might have run for city council instead of running for his life. There may have been no distinct people to receive the law, break the law, or through which our Redeemer would have been born to deliver us from the guilt revealed in the law. God's salvation plan of the ages included slavery as the tool that enabled us to remain identifiable as Jews in Egypt. It was the device that made it possible for us to be miraculously delivered by God from Egypt. 
Now, to any individual slave, slavery may have been a nightmare, but to those of us set free from other forms of bondage, we are eternally grateful. Modern slavery takes on many sinful forms. Spiritually, millions remain in less visible, but just as burdensome chains. Alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography, webs of deceit, serial infidelity, and countless other forms of bondage continue to hold people captive. Nonetheless, freedom is absolutely available through the sacrifice of our Jewish Messiah. He redeems captives and breaks the chains that hold men and women in prisons of sin. Therefore, we give thanks for God's salvation plan of the ages. It came through Egypt, across the wilderness, and into the land of promise, where God's love was made clear. God's mercy continues to enable all who seek his forgiveness to find it through the atoning sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Many of us experience difficult challenges in life. Sometimes we ask God troublesome questions, but none of us should become mad at God because we don't find the answers we seek or like the ones proposed when that happens. Remember Randy's rule of theology. Number three, God is good and he does all things well. You see, God is good and he does all things well. The question I was forced to ask about myself was, did my anger over God's attitude toward the slaves cross the line into sin? Yes, it did. I was angry at God without cause. God is just and has the right to judge any or all sinners. By asking some of the questions I asked in the way I posed the question, I was doubting God's inherent goodness, and that is an unacceptable attitude for a believer. I'm thankful that a quick reset and healthy default was permitted by God. He is good, and he does all things well. Sin does lurk at our doorstep. It comes in many forms. It is a form of leaven that should never be welcomed or allowed to rise. There is no place for comets, for leaven in our life. Sin must be removed before it poisons our eternal soul. If you think that was a lot, I celebrate Passover and have celebrated Passover every year since I was a small child. So I understand we're digging in deep here, uh, but stick with us. We're going to take a short break. Maybe go grab some of your family or friends and bring them back with you when we come back from the break. Did you know that leprosy still exists? That's why a few years ago, we worked with World Missionary Evangelism to create a leper clinic here in India where we provide the medicines and food and the gospel on a daily basis. One thing we found was that the children of leper patients were contracting the disease as well because they get the disease through regular daily contact over long periods of time. So we worked with WME to create a children's home where the children of these leper patients could live nearby their family, but give them a hope and a future free of the disease. Would you consider sponsoring one of these children? Would you consider helping to give them a hope and a future? For just $25 a month, you can give that hope. You can provide that future. Less than a dollar a day. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. I appreciate you sticking around. We've been using a Haggadah that my dad wrote for the last 10 or 15 years, maybe even longer than that in my home. And so uh, I'm fairly familiar with this. I hope you can become familiar with it as well and have one of these for your house. And uh, we'll give you a little bit more information about that in a moment. We've got a lot more to go, so I'm gonna throw this back to my dad to continue about the Passover backstory. I 
want to discuss assimilation as a strategy. Did you know that long before the Egyptians enslaved us, the Shechemites attempted to subdue the children of Israel through what I call the embrace and engulf technique? Their plan was to use assimilation as a strategy to erase God's legacy for the children of Israel. And had the Shechemites succeeded, it would have created irreparable havoc to God's salvation plan of the ages. What began as an act of rape could have led to the destruction of the line of Judah. You know, our most famous kings, major sections of the Bible, and our Messiah was produced through the line of Judah. If this theory sounds incredible, read the account of the rape of Dinah in the 34th chapter of Genesis. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, yet dual conspiracies were simultaneously at work in that tragic event. Shechem brutally raped Jacob's daughter Dinah. Apparently the incident caused him to fall head over heels in love with her. The Bible says his soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman. It goes on and says, So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. Well, on the surface, it appeared that Shechem's father approached Dinah's family to make amends. The Bible says, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Jacob's family countered with religious concerns. Her brothers held deceptively vengeful plans of their own. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They were going to lie to him. And they said to them, Oh, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. In a fascinating look behind the curtain, Scripture reveals the devious plot intended by the Shechemites. Their cunning plan to embrace and engulf was very subtle. They had an agenda to conquer the children of Israel through assimilation. The method was made clear wherein the Bible says, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives. Let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. Their idea was to accept the Jewish demand for circumcision as an accommodation to the Jews. Their intent was to overcome them by having the children of Israel assimilate into the Shechemite community. The lineage for all of Israel's sons, including Judah, would have eventually become indistinguishable from the neighboring people. God's salvation plan of the ages would have been dealt an unholy and irreversible blow. However, the sons of Israel had their own even more devious conspiracy planned for the circumcision of the Shechemites. Their plan was to conquer and destroy. The Bible says, Now it came to pass on the third day, when they were in pain, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly 
upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city, what was in the field, and all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. You see, while their enemies were incapacitated from the surgery, Dinah's brothers proceeded to annihilate every man who could have raised a sword against them. Jacob's sons were justifiably furious over the rape of their sister. Their response was nonetheless horrifying and treacherous. Yet, their act of treachery also spared the children of Israel from becoming assimilated. Instead of being lost to history like so many of their ancient peers, the twelve tribes of Israel survived to become identified as the chosen people of God. The biblical account caused me to reflect on other trends that might have led my people into oblivion or lost in the constantly changing milieu of history. It also startled me into evaluating the current milieu facing our modern culture. People groups lose their identity in many ways. Once lost, it is unlikely to be restored. The Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites, Jebusites, Canaanites, and the other ites of the ancient world have vanished. It's a miracle that God's chosen people have been kept alive and distinct while our ancient peers have been forgotten. I hope that you've gained some insight on the history related to Passover. I know it's been a lot of information, but knowing it makes your own Passover celebrations that much more meaningful. If you'd like a copy of the book, A Passover Backstory by Dr. Randy Weiss, you can visit randyweiss.com or of course crosstalk.org to order a paperback copy, or you can download a free copy, a PDF version on the website as well. I highly encourage you to check it out. The book even includes a do-it-yourself Passover manual so that you can provide your own Seder meal in your home or with your church if you wish. Hey, if you enjoyed this teaching, I recommend following us on social media. You can find us on all the major platforms by searching the handle at Crosstalk TV. That's the best way to make sure that you never miss any episodes and that you receive the little nuggets of teaching throughout the week. If you've been blessed by this ministry and would like to support us, I would encourage you to pray about what God would have you to do. You can always reach out to us online at crosstalk.org. You can, of course, connect with us through social and we can provide different methods, but you can call us as well at 1-800-688-3422. Your contributions can be sent in by mail to P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106. And of course, you can also give on the website, crosstalk.org. We encourage you, come back next week for more of this uh, important content. And until next time, shalom and God bless.